Cool. Uh, so, well, hi everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to to present this work. So, this is a an, uh, a work that has been published very recently in February this year in Nature Genetics and goes by the title promoter shape varies across populations and affects promoter evolution and expression noise. And the idea of the title was to uh, introduce you to the object of the, of the work, which is the core promoter of a gene. And which is, when we talk about the promoter, then you, you, you can think of a, like a big abrasion of promoter that includes uh, both the core promoter and what we call the a promoter proximal regulatory region, which is like the proximal enhancer regions, let's say. Uh, but we actually refer to the core promoter, uh, sorry, as core promoter to the collection of, of very defined motifs that are in charge of recruiting the general transcription factors that will in turn recruit the RNA polymerase too, in case of eukaryotes and with the help of regulatory regions such as enhancer initiate transcription. Uh, so there are different motifs that, that, that perform this work, which are most, some of them are conserved, so others are, uh, let's say, uh, film specific. But what I would, what I want to transmit to you is this is not, the promoter is not just uh, a boring uh, docking site for general TFs. Uh, it actually has a regulatory role. Some of them have been acknowledged for some years ago. Um, for example, the type of the class of promoter uh, can select which regulatory elements will regulate the transcription of that particular gene. Uh, it, it helps to define that what we call the transcriptional regime. Uh, so the frequency of, of birds, the strength of birds, and they actually come in different flavor or promoter classes uh, and actually come in different shapes. And this takes us to, to uh, a very important uh, definition that we use uh, to how this work. And I'm going to spend some time talking about this. So promoter shape might be a little bit uh, misleading term because it, for some people it actually makes them think about like three-dimensional structure of the chromatin or this sort of stuff, but actually refers to a completely different thing. That is the uh, distribution across the DNA molecule of the initiation sites for transcription. And so here we have two examples of with uh, opposite promoter shapes. So in the left, you have what we like a textbook promoter. Uh, so a, a promoter with data box and with initiator, so these types of promoter initiate all the time at the same position. And this is due uh, to this uh, position and uh, motifs at a fixed distance that both recruit the transcriptional uh, machinery and helps and sets the precisely the initiation site. But then you will have another kind of promoter in, and in mammalians it was, uh, it was seen the first time with the CPG island promoters. Uh, so many genes have the CPG, what we call CPG island promoters that lack these very defined uh, motifs like Datapox or initiator and have a, a, a multitude of weaker motifs like SP1, for example. Uh, and this shows a lot of uh, transcription star site use at roughly the same frequency. So more than two years ago, uh, Peter Canin, she developed a method to quantitate this genome-wide for all the genes, uh, like the, the TSS usage uh, across the genome. And this, uh, this method is called, is called CAGE, that comes from CAP analysis of gene expression and refers to the fact that you use the CAP structure uh, that is uh, placed at the beginning of every uh, pol 2 mRNA. Um, to actually create a tag that you will once sequence, you can use, you can map the genome, and then the first position of this tag will tell you with significant resolution which is the position where transcription was initiated. So, you, using this technique, you can construct these uh, sort of maps of TSS usage, and this will tell you quantitatively uh, 
how much a determined position is used to the transcription of that promoter. When they did this for the whole uh, mouse and human genomes, they saw a striking association that was already known for specific cases, but it was striking to see genome wide, which is the sharp or narrow promoters uh, normally are in genes that have either tissue specific or time specific or condition specific expression. So genes that are regulated while the broad promoters are very typical of either housekeeping or ubiquitously expressed genes, sorry. Uh, so the interesting thing is that this uh, association between function and shape is also conserved in other uh, organisms, such as flies that, for example, lack CPG island. So when you look at the promoters in, in Drosophila melanogaster, uh, they still have these different shapes. Um, so <laughs> Okay, so you have three examples of three different promoters with very, uh, very different shapes. And we can quantify this uh, using uh, a shape index that what is found in this Hoskins et al. paper where a cage was done for the uh, Drosophila embryos. Um, this is a measure of the entropy, let's like say, uh, how ordered are the initiation sites in, in a promoter. And they show that this, this is in the y-axis of these plots, while in the x-axis is the promoter width. So it varies almost continuously, although with a, a lot of very narrow promoters located here. And if you took the narrow and pro promoters, then you see uh, the same. The, the narrow promoters are uh, condition specific, while the broad promoters are ubiquitously expressed genes. So what is, what's the relation between uh, the classes of promoter in terms of motif content and the class of promoter in terms of shape. Uh, so a lot of years ago, uh, Uwe Oller described these five promoter classes in Drosophila just based on motif content. So we have this one, which is data box and initiator, the one we talked about before. This is just initiator, this is initiator, and a DPE element typical of Drosophila. Um, and then we have two classes, sorry, which are typical of housekeeping genes that are this DRE uh, containing uh, promoters and these promoters containing two motifs, term motif one and motif six. And, and actually, if you divide the genes in classes and you see uh, the shape of these promoters, then again, you see very clearly that the promoter classes defined by motifs, which are typical of related genes, are narrow while the others are broad. So, this like division uh, of function between narrow and broad promoter uh, is is very consistent, and it is, has been shown not only in Sophila but in a multitude of vertebrates and invertebrates. One last thing uh, for intro, uh, which is there are molecular differences in the in the function of these of these promoters that have, can be seen, for example, at the level of the chromatin array uh, around these promoters. Um, so probably most of you are familiar with the fact that although transcription initiates from a nucleosome-free region, there, there is a very well-positioned nucleosome, uh, which we call the plus one nucleosome, the first nucleosome position after the initiation site. Uh, and this is normally typically expected to be very well-positioned. Uh, and if you, but if you discriminate the promoters according to shed, then you see that it's only well-positioned in broad promoters and not so much in peak promoters, which might not be that intuitive, but it's actually what, what happens. So I mean, actually, this is true also for a very typical uh, chromatin mark for, uh, for eukaryotic promoter, which is a H3K4 trimethylation. Uh, so uh, there's a, something very basic uh, distinguishing uh, broad promoters from narrow promoter. So some of open questions after this. Uh, so what are the genetic determinants of specific promoter uh, strength? So how much a, a promoter is transcribing and shape? Uh, is it possible that these 
two uh, characteristics of Formosa, these two properties uh, can change independently, can evolve independently, or are they always uh, linked one to the other one? Uh, and going back to this conservation of uh, the relationship between promoter shape and gene function between flies and mammals, but across or uh, other organisms, other uh, species too. Uh, this means that there are functional properties which are intrinsically associated with the shape of promoters. So, bro promoters are intrinsically good for housekeeping genes, while narrow promoters are intrinsically good for regulated genes. And also, uh, if shape in the promoter can change, the same gene can be different uh, between one species or between one individual and the other. So, how, how much does this affect the promoter function? So to start uh, answering this, this question, we develop uh, uh, an approach which is a combination of QTL mapping. Uh, sorry, I'm not, I was not planning to explain a lot about QTL mapping, mostly because you are very, uh, I think, uh, used to, to hear about these kind of papers and because I was <laughs> hoping that Enrico uh, will, will explain this. Um, but I can talk a little bit about this. So we will do a QTL mapping, but using gauge as a phenotype. Uh, so we, we normally would do in an expression QTL mapping, you will use some measurement of gene expression uh, as phenotypes, such as, for example, like the total read count in RNA-seq or some stuff. But here we would use cage to actually look at different features of the promoter. So what can cage tells you about expression and promoter function? Uh, so I'm showing you uh, just a genome browser shot uh, from two promoters in in a in a, in a window. Uh, so you can see basically that this is time uh, in embryonic development. You see this transcript level is increasing uh, with time, so you can measure this with cage. So you can measure. So there are two annotated promoters, and you can uh, very clearly see that one is more use throughout the development of the other one, so you can actually measure the use of alternative promoters. This is true also for the other gene. And you can very clearly see the difference between the promoter shape of this very narrow promoter and this quite broad promoter. So what is the, the outline of, of the study? We will have 80 uh, Drosophila inbred lines, so these lines uh, come from a genetic reference panel that is available for Drosophila. Uh, are all species that come from a white uh, type uh, population, um, but then they were inbred for more than, I don't know, I think 20 or something, or 30 generations. Uh, so they reach almost complete uh, homozygosity in the whole genome. Uh, so it was actually not me, but Enrico, who collected embryos and prepared RNA from these 80 lines at three different time points during embryonic development. And with this, I prepare all these cages, uh, cage libraries for all these samples. Um, so we map this to, to the reference genome, and we, uh, and this is, uh, it was a uh, the work of a very, very talented postdoc that was in the lab at, the, uh, at that time, uh, which is uh, Jack Degner, and that he took with very, very creative uh, ideas of how uh, account for difference in morbidity, uh, which is a really pain in the ass for this kind of studies, where actually you correct, uh, you get rid of the position that have morbidity problems, then you will have what we call like the cage signal in the promoter window, and so we define one KB window where we will measure the cage signal, and this will be a, like a phenotype. And for each window where we measure the cage signal, we define a cis candidate window, uh, harboring all the variants that we will test against the changes in the cage signal. And this window was defined as plus minus 100 KB. Uh, so it's a 200 KB uh, sized window. And so all the variants uh, 
include in that window will be tested against changes in the case signal. So how do you use the cage signal uh, if you want to detect complex QTL? So you don't want just to detect changes in total expression level uh, because that would be like uh, yeah, not to take advantage of the high resolution that the cage can give you in terms of uh, single nucleotide initiation sites. And so what you want is a method that can also uh, detect when, for example, in the case in the right, there's not change in strength, but actually change in the distribution of, of, of incision sites. So it will be a change in shape without change in strength. And so if you use the mean signal, you, of, of course, you won't detect this. So also this was the idea uh, from Jack Deckner. And he said, we will use the PC, uh, principal component projections of the signal uh, instead of the mean. Um, and this, this is very well described in the paper if you, if you are curious about uh, the principle and, and how this was done. So the pipeline for QTO calling was then to define all this 1KB window. So this will be uh, transitionally active promoter windows and we find more than 13,000 of these and then test all the variants located plus minus 100 KB from the most used uh, TSS. Um, for testing, we use, uh, instead of mean case signal, we use the PC projections onto the three first principal components. Um, and we use a linear mix model that accounts for all the, the time points uh, jointly. Uh, so they will, this will give you also extra power to detect uh, effects that doesn't depend on the on the stage. And after this, uh, using an FDR threshold of uh, 0.01, we detected more of around 4,000 uh, high confidence TSS QTLs, which is uh, a very interesting proportion, like a third. Of, the, of all the genes in the genome, with just 80 samples, will show some uh, variant affect in promoter function, either in shape, strength, or a combination of both. Um, yeah, so to classify these effects, we apply a, a second uh, analysis method, which is to decompose the cage signal into, into different wavelets, so we can assess the effect at different scales, like the whole promoter or parts of promoter or even at single nuclear resolution. So we can detect where the change is. If it is in strength, it will affect the whole promoter. And if it is in shape, it will affect just specific parts of the promoter. So it is using the WebQTL package uh, developed by the Majesty Defense Group in Chicago. So this is, now we come to the results part. And so using this linear mix model with the first three principal components, projections as phenotypes, and the three time points together gives us an increase in power, either from using uh, the single time points independently or uh, the mean instead of the three principal components. And so we can actually double the number of QTLs roughly uh, by using the three first principal components instead of the mean. And this Venn diagram shows you that actually uh, we are capturing a whole new set of QTLs with the 3 pc meter. So we capture most of the uh, QTLs we call uh, with the mean approach, either common or each type of, uh, individually. And we, we, we've seen that the ones that we don't capture is because they are like, very close to the threshold, uh, but this will, we have a lot, a lot of very new and uh, specific uh, new QTLs which are specific for this method. So here I show you the two two cases, uh, like a simple case in the left, uh, where if you see in the bar plot in the in the bottom, then you will see the um, group of flies that have the major uh, allele for, for this variant has more 
transcription at all sites than the one uh, in red and the ones in blue that has the minor allele for this particular variant. So this in the middle we uh, we plot the raw cage signal uh, and the way it was built is that each each uh, row here it's a, a drosophila line and they were split by which allele do they have in the most significant variant associated with the with the cage. So there was they are already sorted between the group of lines that have the major allele and the group of lines that have the minor allele. And then you can see here very clearly that uh, the lines that have the major allele has higher transcription. So more white is higher uh, and blue is uh, zero uh, than the ones in the minor. So this is a, a typical EQTL, let's say expression QTL case. But, but I want to focus more on the example on the right. And here what you have, again, the lines have been split by the allele in the most significantly associated uh, polymorphism. So the group of red lines have a very well-defined high guess position, let's say, here. But this is almost completely lost in the blue lines. But they compensate this by increasing the strength of some other positions. So actually, you're not losing uh, the whole transcription, but just redistributing it to other other initiation sites within the same promoter. So actually, this can gives you a change in the shape of promoter without a change in total transcription levels. Uh, these are Manhattan plots for for these two genes showing that uh, we can actually detect very specifically individual variants. And this is thanks to, to the uh, population structure in Drosophila that uh, uh, results in very small LD blocks, uh, unlike humans, where you have probably a, a, a ton of variants uh, with roughly the same p-values. And here you can really pinpoint the causal variants. <clears throat> so then, as I mentioned before, we classify these TSSQTLs using this wavelet decomposition. And one thing that the wavelet decomposition gives you are the single base per effect sizes. And this is very useful for understanding what's, have, what's going on uh, in each case. So when you see here, these are the same examples as before. Uh, what you see here is what we told in this case all the single base effect sizes goes in the same direction. So do, in, in this case, it will be higher in red and lower in blue. Uh, but in this case, you have like the major, uh, the major effect size will go in one direction, but most of the others will go in the opposite direction. Uh, so then you see here, again, using this analysis, the difference between a directional change that will change all the positions at the same, in the same direction and Another where you will when you will have some positions going in one direction and some going in the other direction. So to analyze this, we plot uh, we calculate the sum of effects in the primary direction, and then we calculate the sum of effects on the secondary direction. Primary direction is just defined by what what is the the highest effect size, uh, the, the single position, the highest effect size. Uh, and then we plot for each QTL primary duration versus, uh, sorry, the sum of effects in the primary duration versus the sum of effects on the secondary direction. Then we see this plot when we see that QTLs tend to uh, group in two regions. The first region, it's here on the bottom of the plot. And when the second region is uh, along the diagonal line. So in this case, the one which are like very close to the zero in the y axis means all the changes are going uh, in the primary direction. So it will be, I guess, like this. Where in this case, it will be this. Some of the effects in the primary direction and secondary directions are uh, similar. So they are kind of compensated. In this case, you will have 
a change in shape without a corresponding change in uh, abundance of the transcript. So in this way, we define the two main kinds of QTLs that we check, abundance QTLs, so it will affect the total transcript levels. Shape QTL, it will affect the shape of the promoter, but not the transcript levels. And a mixed type of QTLs where both things can change at the same time. <clears throat> so we characterize these this, this different classes, and then we, what we can see is that, sorry, the shape QTLs are mostly located in regions close to the promoter, like proximal uh, DNA hypersensitivity size, uh, fibram UTRs, and actual promoters, while the abundance effects, well, the abundance QTLs are specifically enriched in transcribed regions, such as exons or gram UTR, which may point that some of these abundance effects are actually due to post-transcription elements. If you plot the location of the lead variant, so as I showed you before in the Manhattan plot, then we can really pinpoint which is the lead variant because it will have a higher, uh, sorry, a lower p-value than the other ones. Um, then you will see that for the shape QTLs, these are very, very focused on the, around the initiation site. And we can go a little bit uh, more resolution here. And then you can actually see that they are, in many cases, just next to the actual initiation site. So the take home message of this will be, you can really change the shape of the promoter by just weakening of strengthening the motif that defines the transcription star site, which is not very surprising, but it's nice to see. This is uh, an experiment just to show you that we can prove that the lead variants or the variants with the lower p-value are causal. So we can, we do a, a reporter essay where we just mutate the lead variant and we can uh, measure this using a reporter system uh, translating into S2 cells, Drosophila cells, and then quantifying uh, transcription by flow cytometry. Uh, we can really see uh, for these two cases, but for many others as well, that basically the blue and the green are the same, just uh, mutating the promoter in the lead variant alone reproduces the difference between the major apotype and the minor apotype. So this is actually the lead variant, the causal variant. And just a little bit more uh, unbiased analysis, so we can detect uh, all the variants that affect some kind of promoter, like, for example, initiator-like promoters, or so promoters that uh, are defining the usage of uh, transcription star sites. Uh, and then what we plot here is in the x-axis, sorry, in the y-axis, the strength of the cage signal, so stronger and weaker, and in the x-axis, the shape change, uh, so delta shape index, and narrower will be in the right and broader in the left. And then we can split the, the QTLs where if they are creating uh, or strengthening an initiator like motif or they are destroying or weakening an initiator like motif. And you see very clearly that like, when you create uh, an initiator like motif or you strengthen one, then you get more transcription and it goes narrower, which is exactly what you expect. I'm going to change gears for uh, a little bit. Um, so now we, we believe that uh, we have um, that we have uh, we can really see which are the the variants that uh, predict the change in in shape and strength in the promoter. Uh, but we were actually also uh, trying to, to see what are the difference between uh, broad and narrow promoters. Uh, and just from an evolutionary point of view, these this two kinds of promoter seems to be evolving very differently. So we can detect a lot of more uh, shape QTLs on broad promoters than on narrow promoters. Uh, 
it's hard for us to conclude about this because we, we know also there's a difference in power, so it's easier to detect a shape QTL if it comes in a broad promoter by this method that comes in another promoter. But in you know, if we if you look at the uh, at the selection fingerprints in this in these promoters, uh, you can see that pro promoters also have a higher number of adaptive substitutions, while narrow promoters uh, are actually more conserved. And actually, if you just um, stand in in the in the promoters are affected by QTLs, and then you see the which is the linkage equilibrium. Uh, so how how well linked are these to the neighboring variants? Then you will see that for pro promoters, the linkage disequilibrium is always higher. Uh, so they are more like a, a prototype structure in the pro promoters, which might talk about uh, recent uh, positive selection events. But at the same time, it also supports the fact that uh, some of these variants may be functionally uh, related. Like they, they can actually act as a functional haplotype. And so we, now we, instead of uh, thinking how are, are each of these variants acting uh, alone, so you have to consider how they act in the context of the variants where they are normally uh, are found. Uh, in the natural haplotypes, let's say. So we actually want to assess what are the functional consequences of of the of the changes. In particular, well, we know which are what are the functional consequences of a change in strength. So the promoter will transcribe less. But what are the functional consequences of a change in shape? Uh, are there none? It's completely neutral in terms of of, of selection. That might help to explain why uh, do we see a lot of these uh, shape changes in populations. Um, so to, to measure this, we will uh, we select uh, several uh, shape QTLs and we repeat an essay like I showed you before, but in this case, uh, we didn't measure only uh, expression strength, but also uh, cell to cell variation, which is a proxy for expression noise in this case. Uh, so I present you here well, one place, one example of a shape change in this promoter of this uh, CG gene. So we walk you through this plot, which has a lot of information on it. Um, so we actually have, as before, the, the not only the, the two natural prototypes, the major and the minor, but we also have a mutant haplotype where uh, the minor allele for the causal variant was put in the context of the major haplotype, uh, just as we did before to prove that these variants are, ca are causal. So we want this also allows us to test the effect of the of the change in the causal variant in the context of one haplotype or the or the other appetite and so what we see here is if you change just the causal variant so you keep the major appetite but you change the causal variant then you get uh, a huge increase in noise in expression noise here and uh, actually if you put this variant in its natural appetite so in the minor appetite so you actually go back to the to the natural minor appetite then this no, this increase in noise is alleviated And this is exactly what I just, just told you before. If you uh, change just the causal variant, then you increase noise. And if you put this variant back in its uh, natural appetite by changing all the other ones uh, to, to, let's say, to the blue variant, then you will uh, decrease this effect. And this decrease in noise is also seen when you come from the opposite direction. Uh, so the mutant appetites has always uh, higher noise than the natural appetites. And these are other two examples. So you can see here the, that almost always the, the orange arrows are going downwards. So this tells you that uh, this thing, that when you recover the natural appetite, you 
reduce the noise level. So the mutant haplotypes, when you break the association between the shape change invariants and the neighbor invariants, as always, uh, or in like six of seven cases, we tested higher noise than natural haplotypes. Uh, so that's it. So the conclusions uh, is that we show that promoter shape is, is polymorphic and it's, uh, it's evolving in populations. And that we have found a large set of variants which affect, which affect the promoter shape independently of RNA levels, uh, proving that it can actually be selected independently of RNA levels. And that the variants that define the shape of the promoter are mostly located in the core promoter region. Uh, so this is kind of shape, you can say shape is hardwired to the core promoter con uh, motif content. Uh, and they're in many cases located in the uh, motifs around the TSS. And uh, that broad promoter uh, are, they have more functional variants, uh, specifically those affecting uh, the variance affecting shape, and they will also have uh, a clear evidence of uh, selective, uh, sorry, adaptive selection uh, going on recently. Um, that shape variance, uh, when they occur, they can exacerbate expression noise, but in most cases, they are found in, in haplotypes that reduce this effect, just buffering this. Uh, noise increase. So, well, this is the acknowledgement and, and thanks uh, slide, of course, for all the quotes of, of the paper, uh, especially Chuck Deckner, which developed the GTL current classification pipeline, and Dermot Harnett, who was involved in most of the post-QTL calling analysis, uh, and Enrico, uh, who is going to talk about UNESC and probably uh, comment about the pain in the effort was to collect all these uh, embryos and RNA samples. Uh, but I cannot thank enough, <laughs> Enrico, for saying, sparing me this job. And of course, Eileen, uh, which was a terrific supervisor. Um, just to inform you all that now I'm not working, I'm not working anymore at, at EMBL. I have I moved back to, to, to Buenos Aires, where I originally come from and I'm starting my, my independent group here. So thank you very much.